Hello, this is continue with our cranial nerve um, series. We left it at um, the last lecture. We stopped at um, facial nerve palsy, and we talked about motor neuron lesions and lower motor neuron lesions. So remember, we said lower motor neurons begin from nucleus of facial nerve, motor nucleus of facial nerve in the brainstem. That's lower motor, while upper motor yes. So upper motor neurons are controlling the facial nerve. Now. We said the muscle, the upper part of the feet, get upper motor control from right and left cerebral cortices. So that's why you have purple on both sides. So muscles on the upper part of the face get cerebral cortex. Then only go from the opposite side. Of, so if it's fear. So in upper motor neuron lesion, if you have a lesion at this point, it will spare the upper Part, the muscles on the upper part of the face will not affect open. the muscles on the lower part if you injure this region the muscles will be affected because they are usually controlled by the opposite cerebral hemisphere facial muscle now John it will affect the whole half of the face okay because the nerve lower motor nerves go directly to the muscles so if you injure at this level it's the ipsilateral facial muscle side no wrinkles disappearance of mesolabial folds, food accumulating in the vestibules, um, drooling of saliva, and so on and so forth, inability to blink, so the cornea will dry out. Again, upper motor lesion will spare the upper part of the face and give you contralateral lower facial muscle paralysis. Lower motor lesion will give you ipsilateral, same side of the face muscles will be affected. So these lesions, other le uh, lesions of facial cranial nerve will lead you will cause loss of test. Remember, the anterior two thirds of the tongue, the test is by coda tympani. So if there's facial lesion, uh, facial nerve lesion, you'd get loss of test. Then there'll be loss of tearing from the lacrimal gland. Again, remember, lesions central to geniculate ganglion, lacrimal gland innervation via the greater petrosal nerve. Then uh, we also have hyperacusis where you have increased auditory sensitivity because nerve to stapedius is from facial nerve. So if facial nerve is affected, stapedius is going to be paralyzed. So there'll be increased auditory uh, sensitivity. You get what you call hyperacusis. Then hapis zoster, okay? Hapis zoster, geniculate ganglion, that's associated with in Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So there is primarily it primarily affects regions that are sub, have sensory supply from facial nerve. The motor components are affected by mainly edema in Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So um, we have what you call corneal reflex. Corneal reflex, um, you're able to test the integrity of the fifth and the seventh cranial nerve. Why? When you touch the cornea, something gets into your eye. For example, yeah. So when you touch the cornea with a wisp of cotton wool, or if something comes close to your eye, the subject usually blinks. Why? Because the cornea has sensory innervation by the nasociliary nerve. So this sensation by this cotton wool will be felt by nasociliary nerve. Nasociliary nerve takes this information. Remember, it's a branch of ophthalmic. So it will take the information to ophthalmic sensory information, which will go to principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. This information at the brainstem level will communicate via interneurons communicate with facial motor nucleus to cause the facial nerve that is going to orbicularis oculi to cause the eye to close so this happens in a microsecond and that's how blinking occurs so you can be asked to describe the blinking reflex or corneal reflex when something gets towards the eye the cornea which has sensory innervation from the sociliary of um, ophthalmic will carry this information via trigeminal nerve into the principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. Then interneurons at the brainstem will communicate this principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal with the facial motor nucleus. Then facial nerve carries this uh, to the orbicularis oculi muscle to contract, therefore you close. So this is what happens, sensory stimuli comes, the ciliary will pick it through ophthalmic, you go to trigeminal through the sensory um, nucleus, then from there, there'll be interneuron here that's connecting this sensory nucleus to uh, facial motor, and then 
the facial nerve comes like this, remember, around the abducens nuclei, then it will cause the orbicularis oculi to close. So that's about the corneal reflex. So we go to the eighth corneal nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So we have vestibular portion and cochlear portion. The vestibular portion is for equilibrium. It comes from the neurons of vestibular ganglion. And the cochlear nerve arises from the neurons of the spiral ganglion of the cochlea. So it's for hearing. The vestibular cochlear nerve usually emerges between pons and medulla. So at the cerebellopontine angle behind the facial nerve. So vestibular um, and cochlea, both are spatial um, somatic afferent. So you have four vestibular nuclei and two cochlear nuclei at the pontomedullary junction. The cochlear portion is at the, uh, on the inferior cerebellar pedicle. So the vestibular senses equilibrium from a sense of equilibrium or balance and carries this information from the utricle, the circular, and the semicircular canal. These are the receptors for balance within, that are located in the ear. And then the cochlear nuclei senses hearing from the hearing receptor, which is the organ of corti, again, in the ear. So you have your vestibular nuclei, superior, lateral, inferior, and medial. So there are four vestibular nuclei. So the cochlear nerve is usually bipolar uh, nerve. Um, and sorry, so the cochlear nerve, how is it formed? So we have bipolar receptors in the ear, okay, from the organ of corti. These are the organ of corti hair cells. They are bipolar receptors. So the axons will pass into the internal auditory meatus and relay in the spiral ganglion. So from the spiral ganglion, that's where the cochlear nerve originates. So remember, the vestibular and cochlear nerves enter the brainstem at the cerebellopontine angle. They're sensory, so they're carrying from the ear into the brain. That's how they carry information. So this is just to show you um, the ear. So this is your organ of corti at this level, okay? Spiral organ of corti. Is low. These are the hair cells of organ of corti. And you can see if it's from the fibers of these hair cells that you form your cochlear nerve for hearing. Vestibular nerve, the receptors um, for balance are also bipolar receptors located in the inner ear. They include the macula of utricle and circle and the ampulla of the semicircular canals. Those are the receptors. And the axons from these receptors also pass through the internal acoustic meatus and relay in the vestibular ganglion. Cochlea was relaying into the spiral ganglion. These ones are relaying into the vestibular ganglion. Then the vestibular nerve will originate from the ganglion. So this is what we're talking about. This is a semicircular canal, okay? And this is your vestibular cochlear nerve. So this is your vestibular nerve. This is your cochlear nerve. Together you form your vestibular cochlear nerve. So lesions to vestibular cochlear nerve. So that's how short they are from the ear. So you need to know the receptors, organ of corti for cochlear, and then macule of utricle and circle, and um, ampulla of semicircular canals. Then cochlear uses spiral ganglion, vestibular nerve uses vestibular ganglion. So from the ganglion, the uh, postganglionic fibers carry the information to the brain. Okay. So Lesions of vestibular cochlear nerve can occur when you have a tumor. You look at this tumor in the cerebellopontine angle. So it's going to affect, this is an, uh, affect the structures in the CP angle. So you can also have a caustic schwannoma, which is also a tumor of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So the clinical features of vestibular cochlear nerve injury, if it's a cochlear part, it will be associated with deafness and tinnitus. And if it's a vestibular part for balance, they will be associated with nystagmus and vertigo. So nystagmus is sort of oscillatory eyeball movement, okay? Then um, we go to the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the ninth cranial nerve. It uses five nuclei, the gastatory nuclei. This receives a special visceral afferent from posterior third of the tongue and test buds in the pharynx, or test gastatory. Then solitary nuclei, which receives the general visceral afferent fibers from posterior third, so pain and temperature from posterior third of tongue, pharynx, carotid sinus also. Then we have spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve. Glossopharyngeal also uses spinal nucleus of trigeminal. Again, you have general um, sensory afferent from the pin of the ear and external auditory meatus. Then we have the nucleus ambiguous that receive the uh, send special visceral efferent from. Um, 
components of the brachial arches, such as the stylopharyngeus muscle. Then in free salivary nucleus that sends preganglionic sympathetic, that's general visceral efferent fibers to the parotid gland. So these are the five, you need to know the five nuclei and the functions, which ones are for taste, which part of the tongue, which ones are for the secretions of the parotid and so on and so forth. So again, you just locate, this is your nuclear ambigus here, this is your superior salivary tree, this is inferior salivary tree, this is your spinal nucleus or trigeminal, this is your nucleus solitarius. So those are the ones used by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, so what's the cause? From the medulla, it exists from the medulla by rootlets that are located lateral to olive. And these rootlets are above those of cranial nerve 10 and 11. So they will pass through the middle portion of the jugular foramen, middle portion of jugular foramen, then emerge posterior to the styloids process. Then you have two sensory ganglia of this glossopharyngeal nerve. You have a superior and inferior sensory ganglia. Parasympathetic axons from inferior salivary tree nucleus will enter the otic ganglion, okay, and um, through the tympanic branch. They also convey sensory fibers from the ear. Now, glossopharyngeal descends in the neck and supplies stylopharynges, muscle, and the carotid body. After that, we see it passing between internal and external carotid arteries and enters the pharynx. There, it provides sensory fibers to the pharynx. So it forms pharyngeal plexus that will supply the mucosa of the pharynx and the posterior tongue. So what are the branches of glossopharyngeal? You have a tympanic branch. This enters tympanic cavity. Then it crosses the medial wall of the middle ear as the tympanic plexus. After that, this tympanic uh, plexus will re-enter the cranium and give off the lesser petrosal nerve. So enter the cranium, gives lesser petrosal. This lesser petrosal will exit by a foramen oval and terminate into the otic ganglion. So this tympanic nerve contains general visceral afferent fibers that will innervate the mucous membrane of tympanic cavity and eustachian tube and the pinna of the ear and external auditory meatus. Then we also have um, general visceral afferent to pharyngeal plexus, nerve to stylopharynges, the carotid sinus branch, small contribution to, to carotid body, and the last being principally uh, vagal. Then there's a tonsilla branch and a lingual branch that supplies the posterior third of the tongue. Okay, test to the posterior third of the tongue. So these are the branches of glossopharyngeal. So you need to remember that um, it will exit through the uh, jugular foramen, but the tympanic branch will um, give a lesser petrosol that will enter the cranium and exit through foramen oval. Then from there, it will enter the otic ganglion. Synapse with uh, post-ganglionic post fibers that will go to the parotid gland and cause it to secrete. So again, this is... Um, from the medulla through the middle part of the jugular, you have the two ganglion, the superior and inferior ganglion. Then tympanic plexus will form from it. Lesser petrosol will go back to the cranium and exit through foramen oval. Then enter the otic ganglion, postganglionic from otic ganglion will go and innervate the parotid. So that's parasympathetic through lesser petrosol. But we also have brachiomotor fibers to stylopharynges the general sensory to middle ear, the tonsil, the pharynx and the tongue, and special visceral providing test in the posterior third and baroreceptors to the uh, chemoreceptors to carotid body and carotid sinus. So those are the branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve. So these are the superior and inferior jugular, this is the jugular foramen, superior and inferior ganglion. Okay, and then you can appreciate the otic ganglion here. So you have your lesser petrosol to the otic ganglion, then the postganglionic to the parotid gland, but you also have branches to stylopharynges to the carotid body, the carotid sinus, pharyngeal muscles, then to the posterior third of the tongue, providing test. So those are the branches of. So we have what you call gag reflex, where glossopharyngeal is the afferent, so it will carry that sensation when you tap the back of the of the, the tongue. Afferent will be by glossopharyngeal, then efferent will be by vagus. So you're able to test both 9 and 10 cranial nerves through a gag reflex. So lesions will give you loss of gag reflex, loss of test in the posterior third of tongue, and reduction of secretion on the ipsilateral parotid. So those are the clinical features of lesions of the ninth cranial nerve. So next we discuss the vagus nerve.